Hey, blessings, fam. If you're joining us, NRH, Keller, West Fort Worth, or Dallas, we bless you in the name of Jesus. And we realize that today is not just any day. It is the day that the Lord has made. And so we're going to choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, a special shout out to all the fathers uh, at all of our locations. Like, like we mentioned, not just a biological father, but even our spiritual fathers and grandfathers. Thank you for taking your place and leading the next generation closer to Jesus. I'm honored uh, to bring you the word today. If we haven't met, my name is Emmanuel. And, you know, leading up to today, I was telling Rick, I was just so nervous about what to preach on. And I want to honor Rick for letting, like, the next generation of preachers uh, have the altar. I want you to know we don't consider this a stage to perform from. Uh, this is an altar to sacrifice on. And, and I want to honor Rick for setting the example for that. And so leading up to today, I was like, man, I could preach on so many things. I had ideas on cool word plays to do, and it was clear that I'm supposed to preach from the topic, holy unto the Lord, holy unto the Lord. So in the beginning, God, alpha and omega, in the beginning and in the end, creator and sustainer, author and finisher, powerful yet approachable, knowable and unexplainable, just yet merciful, and yes, full of both grace and truth. He holds the world that he spoke into existence in his hands, and yet he sent his son to die for the world that he holds, because only a perfect and blameless sacrifice is holy enough. God is holy. I won't forget the moment that God made it clear to me that this was the topic. I was driving to work, and I was asking God, okay, we're getting closer to Father's Day. What do you want me to uh, bring to your people? And I would never forget, he told me very clearly, tell them how holy I am. And I spent the rest of that drive trying to convince this holy God to let me teach on anything else. <laughs> Please. Because <laughs> what do you say? What do you say? I don't have enough words in my vernacular that are adequate enough to explain or express to you the holiness of our God. I feel so insecure. I, I don't know what I can offer you, but out of obedience to God, I'll try to offer you what he told me. So here we are. God is holy. In its simplest definition, to be holy is to be unique or set apart. And I love the way one preacher put it that I heard recently. Uh, he was describing his family dynamic and how there's a certain time of year or a certain guest that comes to the house where in those specific instances, a certain set of dishes will be brought out. And I have a photo for you. Um, these are the dishes that only come out. They're, they're taken from the attic. They're set apart. They are clean, prepared, set on the table. You know something special is happening when these dishes are on the table. And then after the meal is had, they're washed very specifically and then stored, set apart from the other dishes that you eat like french fries and hot dogs on. <laughs> In a similar way, the holiness of God is this way, isn't it? Set apart from anyone and anything else. You see, God's holiness doesn't make him just set apart from some things. Uh, God is set apart from everything and everyone. The difference between the holiness of God and, quote, the holiness of fine china is that, you know, these dishes come out every once in a while, and then we store them. We take care of them. We make sure they don't break. The holiness of God, because of the finished work of Jesus, doesn't just come out sometimes for some people. It is available to us all at any time. The holiness of God is not worried that it'll be broken or contaminated by us. And so, what do we do with this holiness? You know, we frequently talk about the love of God, and we should. And we talk about the grace of God, and we should. And we talk about the forgiveness of God, and we should. But what about his Holiness. So, 
Holiness is not just an attribute of God, like love or mercy or grace. Holiness is everything that God is. For example, God's love is holy. God's peace is holy. God's wrath is holy. His mercy is holy, and so on and so forth. Anything that is holy was made holy by God because only the one that is uniquely other can make other things that too. I'll prove it to you. Look at Genesis 2 verse 3 with me, please. And anytime you see the word holy as you read, please say it out loud at every location. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all of his creation. Friends, God makes days holy. Look at Exodus 3 verse 5 with me. Same thing. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. God makes the ground holy. In Exodus 19 verse 5, now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. Church, God makes us holy. The word holy is referenced no less than 500 times in the Old Testament alone. And over 40% of those occurrences are found in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. What does that tell us? That the holiness of God and our awareness of it is foundational to our understanding of God of his kingdom, of the world, and yes, even of ourselves. The holiness of God is made much of in the beginning of the canon of scripture. But let's be honest. You know, I keep it real. When we think about the holiness of God, what do we think about? I'll go first. For me, I think about moral perfection. I I think about, uh, candidly, uh, a couple people in my life that were like Pharisees. Um, that they were so holier than thou, they could do no wrong, and they were quick to tell me when I did wrong. Uh, That's what I think about when I think holy. What do you think about? Hopefully you thought about something. Moral perfection and moral goodness is a part of holiness, but there has to be more. There has to be. Friends, God is the only deity that has the power to speak and things become. The world as we know it is a result of a word of God. And not just that. He also has the brilliance to create systems that sustain the world that he made. Our God is not just morally perfect. Our God is transcendent. What do I mean? That every good thing you think about God, yes, times infinity, that's who he is. This is why I feel so inadequate and insecure to be up here with this topic. What can I tell you? No matter what I say, I will fail in my attempt in expressing to you the holiness of our God. Because me as a creation in my finite capacity, I barely scratched the surface to explain to you the infinite one. Oh, the uncreated one who created everything, the one who always was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. I just want to pray and cry for the next 25 minutes. (laughs) And maybe we'll do some of that at the end. (laughs) I like the way the Bible Project puts it. Maybe this will help. The holiness of God is kind of like the sun by way of metaphor. You see, the sun is holy because it is set apart or unique. The sun sustains life on earth, and it is the heart of our solar system as we know it. And even the area around the sun is holy because if you get too close to the sun, what happens? Poof. (laughs) At the same time. We need vitamin D from the sun for our health, and the sun helps plants and the earth live. What a paradox we find here, that the sun is so powerful that it can kill us, but it's also so necessary that it sustains us. Make that make sense. This paradox is similar to God's holiness in the scripture. You see, in Israel's temple, there was a section called the most holy place. 
And in the most holy place, only the high priest was allowed to enter. And even he had to be cleansed and ritually clean before entering. It was so serious that they would wrap a rope around his waist as he entered the most holy place, just in case he had some hidden sin. Because if he did, they'll have to pull out his dead body because he got too close to the, quote, son. Does this make sense, what I'm saying? That's the power and the the glory of our God. And so here's the problem I want to present to us today. Sin cannot exist in the presence of a holy God. And what a problem that is. Because how sinful am I? Isaiah the prophet, he knew this good and well. This week, we're going to sit with a vision that God gave Isaiah, and I know that our host read it, but I would love to read it again. And if you're able, please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Isaiah chapter number six and verse one. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. Two wings covered their faces, and two covered their feet, and with two they flew. And they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, It's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you. King Uzziah. I want to tell you a little bit about him. King Uzziah was a great and wise king. And I want to tell you this, friends. Uh, There's a reason why everything in the Bible is there. I remember so many times I've read this specific story, and verse one will say, in the year King Uzziah died. I'm like, who cares? You know, like, <laughs> like does that matter to this amazing vision? And uh, I learn, I learn, I so, I'm so young, and yet I learn, I learn that everything in the Bible is intentional. Here's why this matters. King Uzziah was a king for 52 years. And for my teenagers in the room, he began reigning at 16 years old. Yeah, I didn't know how to ride a bike when I was 16 years old. (laughs) And he was king. 52 years served faithfully. The Bible says all over the scriptures how great he was, how faithful he was. But here's why it matters that he died when, when a God gave Isaiah the vision. Pretty close to this moment, King Uzziah got more and more powerful. And the more powerful he got, the more prideful he became. Specifically in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, it talks about a moment where King Uzziah, all high and mighty, enters Israel's temple, the the place I referred to where the sun lives. And he decided to burn incense to God. And he knows good and well that only the high priest can do that. And so the high priest enters the temple and rebukes him. Like, yo, what are you doing? And King Uzziah, instead of humbly repenting, he got furious and said, I know what I'm doing. And in the moment, God gave him leprosy and King Uzziah died in isolation. Here's the lesson. It's good to have power, but don't forget who gave it to you in the first place. So imagine Isaiah here. Isaiah had been a prophet for so long, and and all of a sudden, the king that was so good to the people of God is dead. Isaiah is a little discouraged, like, God, where are you in this? Why would you allow this? And now that we have some of that context, it gives a wow factor to the vision that God gave Isaiah. What is the first thing that God uh, shows Isaiah in the vision? We see in verse 1, Isaiah sees God sitting on the throne. So where is God? Still sitting on the throne. Maybe in your circumstance, you're wondering on this Father's Day, God, where are you in my situation? You know what's happening with my dad. You know the dad I've tried to be. You know my hurt. You know my trauma. You know my hang up. Where are you, God? And somebody needs to hear. No matter where you are, God is still on the throne. Your circumstances are not greater than him. 
You see, the core belief of atheism and materialism is that there is no throne at all. There is no seat of authority, no seat of power of all the universe that we must answer to. The core belief of humanism is that there is a throne, but God doesn't sit on it. Man does. But the Bible makes clear, friends, that there is a throne in heaven, and no fallen man sits on it, but the Lord God is enthroned on it forever and ever. Amen. So, what is God immediately telling Isaiah in the vision? I know Uzziah was a good king, but I am the king of kings. <laughs> Verses 2 to 3 tell us about these angels called seraphim. Please say seraphim. seraphim. Kind of a fun thing to say. I love how the pastor Charles Spurgeon puts it. He says, For the seraphim remembers that even though they as angels are sinless, they are yet a creature. And therefore, they conceal themselves in token of their nothingness and unworthiness in the presence of a thrice holy one. You see, they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And as we read, they are doing this while covering their faces. In addition, if you read carefully, the Bible says that they were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy. Why? Because they consider the, that God is so worthy that they can even worship God directly. They will worship God indirectly, hoping that he hears it and receives it. This is the magnitude of God. That even the own angels aren't worthy of actually worshiping him to his face. So why? Why do they say holy, holy, holy three times? Uh, scholars believe one of two reasons. Number one, as Spurgeon put it, our God is three persons in one. Father, Holy Spirit, Son, and they are all holy. Uh, the second reason is because in Hebrew literature... In the language as well, if you want to communicate intensity, you got to do it by way of repetition. And our God is holy to the highest degree, or in other words, our God is holy to the highest level of intensity. Do you just feel that? I just feel that right now. So then smoke fills the temple. And the angels are worshiping God, and the temple begins to shake, the Bible says. And Isaiah responds in fear. I'm doomed, he says. It's all over. I'm a man of unclean lips. There's no way I'm going to survive this moment. I have come too close to, quote, the sun. I'm done. Here's part one of the paradox that I want to teach you today. Number one is the holiness of God should make us fear. Isaiah had an appropriate response here. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says this, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One, say Holy One, holy. results in good judgment. That fear of the Lord has always tripped me up. Because when I think of the fear of the Lord, I think of like being scared of an abusive parent. I think I better not let him catch me messing up because then, blank. This is not the fear of the Lord that the Proverbs are teaching us here. This is fear of the Lord because of his glory and power. Uh, this is not a cowering fear that should make us run and hide. It is a fear that makes us revere the power and glory of God. There's a difference. Author and my buddy Luke Lefevre recounts in his book on holiness how professional sailors talk about the ocean. This is fascinating. He says that those who really, like, look at me, really have seen the ocean, not like I went on a boat trip, like, you know what I mean? Like, like I'm talking like really. Those who have really seen the ocean, there's a different level of fear and trembling in their voice, but also at the same time, a level of love and wonder that none of us that stay on the shore can understand. One sailor specifically said, never in my life have I experienced such beauty and such fear at the same time. <laughs> this, these sailors had a healthy fear of the ocean's power, and they also had a longing 
even a desperation to be near it. They couldn't stay away, church. There was a glory they'd experienced in the ocean's fearsomeness. This is what it's like to fear a holy God. Don't run off. Is he holy, holy, holy? Yes. Are you and I sinful? Yes. But wait. Can I be real for a moment? Christians, you and I, have tried to weaponize the holiness of God in order to scare people into repentance, haven't we? And so as a youth pastor over a decade now, I've seen generation after generation after generation of sons and daughters of God that are following God, not because they want to gain heaven, but because they want to avoid hell. Somebody say, sheesh. And that stops today. The holy God has given us authority to bring heaven to earth. And so our eyes shouldn't be on hell and earth. Our eyes should be on earth and heaven. We need a sight correction. And this is in some ways what Isaiah got. You see, maybe we were not taught that the fear of the Lord onto wisdom and reverence for God is good. Maybe we were taught to fear the Lord by way of distance and even cognitive dissonance. What I'm trying to say is we've mistaken distance for reverence. Maybe you're listening to me and you think, this is why I've stayed far from God. I've stayed far because I wanted to respect, I wanted to revere. Maybe you are here and you smell like smoke from the night before, but what if we as a church didn't judge you? Instead, we would pray that the smoke of the Lord, of the glory of God will fill this church so that we can all see the smoke the same. I wonder what would happen if the holiness of God was not contingent on our worthiness or even our effort. I wonder what would happen if, like Isaiah, we would realize that reverence is not distance, but instead, when we touch the Holy One, that's when we actually become holy. Look at what happens to Isaiah in verse 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal. He had taken it from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Man, I feel the presence of God. This is kind of what happens when the holiness of God enters the room. I don't even know what to do with myself. Imagine a seraphim flying to you with a hot coal. You should be fearful. Isaiah was. God's holiness should make us fear. But here's the other side of the paradox. God's holiness should make us draw near. Make it make sense. I should fear you, and when I'm afraid, I typically think, run, hide, it's too much. But at the same time, God is saying, draw near to me, come close to me. If I get too close to the sun, won't I die? I don't get it. How can you sustain me and how can I fear you? I don't know what to do with myself. The reality is Isaiah should have been struck down. Only a high priest should enter the temple, remember? Isaiah is not a high priest, and still he chose to enter in, and instead of being struck down, God touched him. He he said, woe is me, and he is right. He's right. In Isaiah 17, a few chapters later, before we read it, Isaiah is prophesying the destruction that will come to Damascus and Israel and Judah because of their rebellion, only to say this in verse 7. Look at this. Then at last, the people will look to their creator and turn their eyes to the Holy One of Israel. Everyone, please say Holy One. 
And they will no longer look to their idols for help or worship what their own hands have made. They will never again bow down to their own Asherah poles or worship at the pagan shrines they have built. Their largest cities will be like a deserted forest, like the land the Hivites and Amorites abandoned when the Israelites came here so long ago. It will be utterly desolate. Why? Because you have turned from the God who can save you. You have forgotten the rock who can hide you, so you may plant the finest grapevines and import the most expensive seedlings. Isn't it ironic, church? And when we see a holy God, we want to hide, and all he wants us to do is hide in him. I love that verse 7 begins with the language, at last the people will look to their creator. Have you considered that the holy, holy, holy God isn't a distant bystander, just maybe they'll come to me. I don't care. I don't need them. Maybe even though he doesn't need us because he is holy and self-sustaining, he's actually waiting. That he hovers over our lives hoping that we would look to him again. I don't get it. Why does he want us so bad? Church, I don't want us to look at ourselves as saviors only to find ourselves in destruction. I don't want our cities, Fort Worth, Dallas, North Richland Hills, Keller, New York City, every city of the world, I don't want our cities to become desolate because we have turned away from the only one that is worthy to look to in the first place. So the call for all of us today is what Isaiah said, turn your eyes to the Holy One again, please. Because the problem is that sin cannot exist in the presence of a holy God. But here's God's response to the problem. God doesn't need to be protected from your sin. Your sin is endangered by the holiness of him. That's God's response. Isaiah was probably worried. Oh, no. I'm going to contaminate God and his holiness with my presence. I'm doomed. And instead... God, with an angel and a burning coal, quote, contaminates Isaiah's sin with his holiness. God, please do that in me. God, please do that in your church. Isaiah was mindful of King Uzziah and his sin, and he said, I come from a people of unclean lips. Isaiah, once he saw the Lord, he realized it's not just about me. Can we be a people that would see God rightly and realize that it's not just about us? That there's a world that is dying and needs God and we're worried about our own personal circumstance alone? Can we realize that God has called us not just to be holy for yourself, but to be holy so that we can be image bearers of God to the world? Jackie Hill Perry says it this way, Behold the Holy One. In his perfection, all he will ever be is good to us and good for us. Even when suffering breaks into the world, tempting us to curse God and die. Remember that God in whom your suffering was given an allowance, of him it is said, in Lamentations 3, verse 32, that he causes grief and he will give compassion according to his steadfast love. Even when it hurts, it's not as though God has somehow changed, becoming cruel or inflicting pain without purpose. It is not as if when everything collapses in on itself, God will leave you alone to pick up the pieces. As the holy God, he is present in our pain with a steady promise of redeeming it and us for our good. Romans 8, 28 reminds us, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Church, his transcendence makes this possible because if God was a derivative of the world, all of our problems wouldn't even have a leash on them. 
Our God is holy. In the beginning, God is holy. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, author and finisher, creator and sustainer, just yet merciful, powerful yet approachable, unexplainable yet knowable. This is the God that we serve. God is holy, holy, holy. That is who he is. And God will not stop being God when you stop being you. God will be holy after you, and he has been holy before you. And to prove that his love for you is not just an afterthought, the triune God, Father, Holy Spirit, Son, and my holy imagination, they got into a little huddle like this. All right, boys, what's the call? And the triune God chose to send the Son, Jesus, into the world to model for us what living a holy human life can actually look like. And not just that. Once Jesus chose to live the life that we can never live, which is holy, 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 he didn't stop there. He chose to die the death that we should have died so that because of his death, you and I can live a life that is set apart unto King Jesus. This is the gospel. This is the holy gospel. We'll talk more about how we can live a holy life next week. But for this week, fear the Lord and be wise. Uh, number two, draw near to the Lord and be cleansed and receive love afresh. And number three, declare over your home and frankly, every room you enter, God is here and he is holy. And watch how God changes the atmosphere the way he did in the temple. So before we pray at every location, I want us to do something, please. I, I, I fell short today. I don't know what else to say about the holiness of God. But I trust that he can tell you. And so please, with every eye closed in the room, in every room, in every location, all over the world, wherever you are, please close your eyes and have your hands in front of you in a posture of receiving. I'm going to start. And I'm going to give you some time to just be. Some of you have needed this. You haven't been alone with God or in a decent level of silence or solitude in weeks. Some of you even years. With your eyes closed and your hands in front of you. God, please. I know we're not worthy. We feel doomed in the presence of you, oh God. You are uniquely other, set apart from everything and everyone, and yet you want us near. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters, please, right now, with our eyes closed and hands in front of us, would you reveal to us, not just as a family, but as individuals right now, who you are. Please, God, give us a vision like you gave Isaiah, Give us a word from your scriptures. Give us a picture. God, we are desperate for a touch from you. And so, God, now I'm going to be silent and let you speak, even if you speaking is you sending an angel right now with a burning coal in hand to touch our lips. We are open. Here we are. Speak. God, I sense that you're...
speaking a better word to sons and daughters. Yeah, at NRH, at Keller, at West Fort Worth, at Dallas, watching online, I sense right now, hallelujah, that your holiness, yeah, is burning away our iniquity, oh God. I sense right now that those of us who have been distant because we've been trying to be reverent, we are coming back into the arms of our Father. Yeah, I sense prodigals coming back home right now. Yeah, I sense, like the prophet said, zeal for the house of God has consumed me. That your glory has filled every room right now. And that we don't know what to do with ourselves. That you are speaking identity afresh. Yeah, that you're reminding us who we actually are and reminding us that we could stop pretending now. <laughs> we could stop pretending to be holier than thou and we could stop pretending to be too far from you to reach that now we could take our rightful place as sons and daughters of Yahweh, the one true king. Holy, holy, holy are you. Thank you today that you allow us to come to you that you paid for us to stay with you and that because of you, we have salvation, not just for this age, but for every age to come. And I know, King Jesus, that this moment probably needs to end now because we're in time and space. But God, I pray for all of these sons and daughters at every location that this burning desire <laughs> to be near the Holy One will continue to burn beyond this moment, that they can enter eternity with you outside of time and space this week. Yeah, I beg you for my brothers and sisters. Yeah, in Jesus' name. Amen.